right. I think we have everybody, all the speakers and uh, our guests are online. And uh, I can see uh, the webinar has been opened to participants. And I also understand we have uh, live broadcasting in China. So um, let us begin. All right. Um, good afternoon from Shanghai, distinguished guests, colleagues, and the friends. Uh, please let me extend my warm welcome to you all for joining the APRU Sustainable Cities and the Landscape Webinar, themed as Resilient Urban Landscape. So welcome all. I am Ranxin Ding of School of Design, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, and uh, your host for today's uh, webinar. Uh, let me use a few minutes to give you a brief introduction. Shanghai Jiao Tong University has always been committed to the core value of APRU to address climate change, supporting diversity, inclusion, and the minorities along with a network of leading universities. The APRU Sustainable Cities and the Landscape, uh, SCL Hub, hosted by the University of Oregon, aims to unite policymakers, researchers, and practitioners from across disciplines to find answers to uh, vital social, urban, and ecological questions of our time. In one of the world's most rapidly urbanizing regions, interconnection is key to solving critical sustainable issues facing the Pacific Rim, including supplying adequate food, water, and energy while preserving vulnerable populations and ecosystems. Uh, by December 2021, SCL consists of 18 APRU member universities. Professor Che, my colleague, Che Shenquan from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, serves as the chair of the executive council. Under this platform, Shanghai Jiao Tong University initiated the establishment and presided over the Urban Landscape Biodiversity Working Group, which is committed to promoting cooperation in urban landscape protection and the biodiversity enhancement in the Pacific Rim. So let me uh, introduce to you our distinguished guests today. Uh, Professor Luo Peng, Director of International Affairs Division, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Jackie Angelo Wong, APRU Director, Network and Student Programs. Jackie, welcome. And uh, uh, Professor Zhu Xiangning, I hope Professor Zhu is, is online now, Professor and Chair of Shanghai Society of Landscape Architects. And Professor Bob Johnson, Professor of Landscape Architecture, University of Oregon. And uh, our dear friend, Professor James Hayter, IFLA President, Professor of Landscape Architecture, University of Adelaide in Australia, and Professor Che Shen Quan, Professor of Landscape Architecture and the Associate Dean of Shanghai Jiao Tong School of Design. So again, welcome all. Now, uh, this webinar has been enthusiastically supported by Shanghai Jiao Tong University and its International Affairs Division. So let us welcome Professor Luo Peng, Director of International Affairs Division of Shanghai Jiao Tong University to give us an opening speech. So welcome Professor Luo. Thank you very much, Professor Ranxin. Uh, dear uh, distinguished guests, friends, and all colleagues, uh, and all the participants online today, good afternoon. Uh, I'm really very honored to be invited to attend today's opening of this uh, Resilient Urban 
Landscape April SL webinar. On behalf of uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, please firstly allow me to attend a warm welcome to all the friends and the colleagues from, uh, from different part of the world, from uh, different universities being online right now. Also, uh, a, a heartfelt gratitude would go to all the schools and the associ uh, associations that are jointly organizing the, today's event, as well as to the colleagues from April who work in very close connection with, uh, with, with us. SJTU uh, was established in uh, 1896. Uh, it's a, uh, a leading university in China. Its 126 year development has always been focusing itself on being comprehensive, innovation oriented and internationalized. Thus, uh, a true, uh, the School of Design at our university is very young, but it's a, a very dynamic and energetic, energetic school. Uh, it centers itself on architecture, design, and landscape. And more importantly, uh, it very much integrates with humanities, arts, science, technology. Therefore, many prestigious uh, scholars and masters of design have joined in to collectively provide their unique thinking and solutions, feasible solutions to uh, for our global advancement in many fields. Internationalization has always been a very distinctive strategy for our university. In recent years, we have been committed to an open-minded, diversified, and influential global SGTU strategy of Asia. We uh, collaboratively work with the partner universities, constitutions around the world, around the Pacific Rim, to promote academic cooperation in culture understanding, in science and technology, and in educational exchanges. Uh, for, uh, for students' development, we have made a particular effort to update exchange programs with our global virtual classroom. In support of uh, academic research, uh, our faculty have been encouraged to join the research hub within the April framework on sustainable cities and landscapes and sustainable waste management. Moreover, at the April annual meeting and the pre uh, President uh, Forum online last year, we proposed to organize a global summer school that is to be dedicated to the 2030 SDG goals of the United Nations in a uh, concerted effort to nurture youngsters with global competence and uh, leadership. This event is held in celebration of our university's 126th anniversary. In alignment with our international pioneer universities, professional uh, associations and uh, uh, institutions, let us together call for global attention to the environmental issues such as climate change, and biodiversity laws to protect urban ecological civilization. So I wish a complete success of the webinar and the concerted effort needed for our uh, intentions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Luo, for a very comprehensive introduction to the international activities of Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And this is a very fitting uh, introduction, uh, a preamble to our, to our um, uh, seminar. All right, so let me invite Ms. Jackie Wong, representing APRU, to give us some opening remarks. So Jackie, over to you. 
Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon to everyone who's joining us from around the world. On behalf of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, I welcome you to the Resilient Urban Landscapes webinar um, hosted by Shanghai Zhao Tong University. I especially want to thank the organizers of this session, the International Affairs Division, and the School of Design at Shanghai Zhao Tong University. And of course, we can't do this without our APRU Sustainable Cities and Landscapes program. So thank you to all, to all of you involved. My name is Jackie Wong. I'm the Director of Network and Student Programs at the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. Next slide, please. We are a network of leading research universities across the Asia Pacific Rim. And together we bring together leaders of higher education, civil society, governments and industry to address the biggest challenges in our region. Next slide. And throughout these 60 universities, uh, we have a reach of eight, 19 economies around the Pacific Rim with more than 2 million students and over 200,000 faculty members. And we believe that working together, we can make a significant global impact. Our members already do a lot to contribute to the to climate solutions. And so the challenge that we face now is to really work collectively to educate the last generation that has a chance to fix the planet and thereby generate the political will and implement the technolo technological solutions at scale that we need. And this is why we are partnering on the Global Education Project, the worldwide teach-in on climate and justice, which this webinar especially contributes. APRU has a range of programs um, that we work on. The, as you can see here on this slide, we have um, the Asia Pacific Women in Leadership Program, the Digital Economy Program, Global Health, Multi-Hazards, Pacific Ocean, Population Aging, Sustainable Cities and Landscapes, and the Sustainable Waste Management Program. And this, along with our programming that we offer to students, has an undercurrent um, and a thread tying it together um, in which we focus on our climate solution. And it runs through everything that we do. Next slide, please. As mentioned, APRU is proud to serve as a strategic partner on the teaching, on this teaching. Shanghai Jiao Tong University joins APR universities in Canada, Colombia, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Mexico, Thailand, and the US to lead these discussions on climate and justice. And through these discussions, we hope to call on public leaders to foster economic sustainability, build multi-sector partnerships, and develop public trust to instill that top level decision-making. We seek to in inspire students to contribute to civil action, education and awareness raising, public and to um, public conversations on climate change. And we also aim to bring a uh, climate justice perspective to an inter international arena to highlight the need to share resources, equipment, and infrastructure, especially in underrepresented communities, which are among the most directly affected. As universities, we have a special role to harness the research expertise and innovation capacity to stay on the cutting edge of technological advances that can advance our efficiency. And while we all as actively engaged um, climate citizens must take responsibility for our actions, we must also take into consideration the scale at which change must take place in order to reverse the, the effects of climate change today. Next slide. Through this project, um, universities have demonstrated the great capacity to address climate change, the energy of our students to become leaders, and the opportunity for APRU to really serve as that connector for universities in the region. And so we have a range of programs that are um, offer this, this type of programming. Um, and you can visit our website at APRU.org to learn more about these. Um, we have the APRU Global Sustainability Course, a climate change simulation, which is really a great experience for many students across the world, and um, our biodiversity working group. And because we believe that networks and APRU in particular has a pot potential and responsibility to deliver value, we are dedicated to contributing to the well being of our societies and finding solutions to many to the many challenges that confront us. And we invite you to join us on this journey. So um, please feel free to get in touch with myself or anyone on our team 
to learn more about our activities. And I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jackie. And indeed, uh, APRU is a wonderful, wonderful partnership. And we at Shanghai Jiao Tong uh, have been very pleased to be part of its uh, undertaking. And uh, as Professor Lo already mentioned, uh, this event is being held as part of uh, the celebration of the 126th anniversary of Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And uh, due to the current uh, lockdown in Shanghai, the university's official uh, uh, celebration uh, will be uh, postponed, but uh, we will kick it off today. And uh, so that's an that's auspicious occasion. And we as a member of APRU is dedicating to align with universities, professional associations and practices to call for global attention to environmental issues such as climate change, biodiversity uh, loss, and uh, suggest that we should uh, seek innovation, innovative solutions with international perspective and the local characteristics through international cooperation and communication. So for today's session, there will be three presentations focusing different aspects of resilient urban landscape and a free uh, symposium uh, afterwards. We hope we will generate some live discussions. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me welcome Professor Bart Johnson from the University of Oregon to give his presentation. And Professor Johnson is the chair of the International uh, Steering Committee of the Sustainable Cities and Landscape Hub of APRU. And uh, he will uh, speak on the strategies that are most likely to create enduring cities and to be robust against the uncertainties of future uh, climate change. And, uh, those that harness life's own revolutionary capacities. So Professor Johnson and uh, welcome, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm, I'm delighted to be here today. Let me see if I can get my screen shared. And are you seeing my presentation there? Yes. It's my yes. presentation. Great. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, anyway, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today about creating uh, and sustaining climate resilient cities. By the end of the talk, I hope that the relationship between the photos on the left and the icons on the right will make sense and perhaps provide you a new way to conceptualize and critique strategies for how societies may adapt to climate change through. Uh, design and planning. I've split my talk into four sections. The first is a fairly brief introduction about the challenge of climate change for cities. I then want to pose a conceptual framework for climate change adaptation based on ideas of resistance, resilience, and facilitation. I'll then, in the bulk of the presentation, take time to use the framework to critique different adaptive strategies for heat waves, large storms, sea level rise, and wildfire. And then I'll wind up with a few concluding comments for creating and sustaining climate resilient cities. This is a complex slide, but the question it poses is simple. Human societies have developed over the last 10,000 years of relatively stable climate. What will happen when temperatures go outside this historic climatic envelope? So the timeline on the X axis shows from 20,000 20, years in the past to the present, with increasingly short time intervals. It shows that all of what we might call modern civilization has occurred during 10,000 years in which the global average temperatures have fluctuated no more than plus or minus one half degrees Celsius. I added to Corel's notations of Western society, the major Chinese dynasties to show that they fit within that exact same period. So the real question is what happens as on the right when conditions go outside anything we've experienced as you see the IPC projections there for anywhere from two and a half to five degrees Celsius increase in average global surface temperatures. What happens when we enter a period in which lessons from the past are insufficient to guide future solutions? How do we imagine solutions for conditions we've never before experienced? 
So there are two primary responses that we really have to climate change. There is mitigation, that is reducing greenhouse gas emission to try to reduce the extent and impact of climate change. And there's adaptation, responding to climate change so as to reduce its effects on human and natural systems. Both are important, but it's very notable that in last year, in last week's release of the IPCC report, they basically said that if we don't reduce emissions 40% within the next eight years by 2030, we will have entered a phase of uncontained and pretty much uncontrollable climate change. We'll have crossed a tipping point. So mitigation is obviously critical to what we do, but so is adaptation. And I'll focus most of my talk on saying, what do we do as, to adapt? So one question is, are cities particularly vulnerable to environmental change and extreme events? At least to me, it seems quite arguable that they are. And that's in part because of the dynamic ecological context we find them, very resource rich environments that are also prone to disturbances like floods and fire. At the same time, cities are often linked to the needs for distant food, water and energy supplies and those supply chains can be quite easily disrupted. And these stressors interact with extreme climate events, heat waves, droughts, floods, to put people and their things they care about at risk. So given this, what are the qualities of our resilient design solutions that we might try to achieve? So I just have four short points here to get before the end of the framework. And the first is that proactive adaptation requires anticipating climate trends and uncertainties. This is a 2006 visualization by the Union of Concerned Scientists that basically suggests that under less extreme climate change, that is better emissions control in yellow, that by the end of this century, the, the summer feeling of heat in the state of New York, upstate New York, might be like that of, for the state of Virginia along the US coast. And that if we don't control emissions, we go to higher emission scenarios, which frankly are now the norm, then what was extreme has now become the normal ex expectation. The climate of New York could be like that of Southern Georgia or South Carolina. That's pretty much like going along the entire coast of China or along Japan. The slide on the right suggests in terms of numbers, how many days you may have over 38 degrees C, 100 degrees Fahrenheit in New York City, going from a two per year at present to as many as 70 a year under the best scenarios to over 25 days a year over 100 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. That's heat waves, that's extreme heat outside of any experience we've had. Similarly, climate change is already occurring. We've gone past the point of thinking about projections, it's occurring, and we have to be able to act quickly because what used to be extreme events are becoming normal. So the challenge then is how do we think about making enduring solutions, solutions during a time of rapidly changing climate? I, I look to the well a lot to think about Frederick Law Olmsted and his prescience in the designs for things like not just Central Park, but in particular the Boston Back Bay fans at a time of increasing industrialization and concentration of people in large cities. And in particular, the design that was done for Boston's Back Bay Fen, at the time it was done, was actually a bioswale that was uh, cleansing human sewage that was being dumped into the Back Bay and threatening people's health. So it used biological mechanisms of a swamp, of a marsh, to cleanse the water. But that function stopped a long time ago. We've had sewage treatment plants. But that park is there almost in this identical shape now to what it was in 1879. And I think it's pretty easy to argue that because it met many other needs, it was a good design. It was enduring because it met multiple needs for society. Finally, it's just a fourth sort of pointer to me that's always inspired me is that we need to learn how to harness um, evolutionary's, evolution's adaptive capacity by applying the genius of ecosystem projects to urban design and planning. We need nature inside cities and urban designs as part of climate resilient strategies. And I'll continue to make the argument for that. So here's the framework. The idea that adaptive strategies might be considered to be resistant, that is, we manage landscapes to oppose changes and impacts associated with climate change. They can be resilient. That is, we attempt to manage landscapes so that ecosystems and people can dissipate or quickly recover from climate impacts with few dramatic changes, or they can be facilitative. We can help ecosystems and people transition toward new states that are better, better adapted to changing climatic conditions. So those icons on the right, somebody holding back a dam with water before it breaks, somebody sort of bending in the wind without being blown over, or two people reaching across the chasm to help 
each other across to a new climate facilitated state. So keep those in mind as we go through this. And what I'm gonna do next is walk through examples for heat waves, large floods, ocean rise and wildfire, and try to make the case that this is a useful way to think about, imagine solutions, but also critique them. So for each of these, I'll have several examples, in this case, looking at air conditioning as resistance, green roofs as resilience, urban forests as resilient, but potentially facilitative solutions. And I would note that as we move across those factors, we're also increasing in the size and scale of solutions. So air conditioning is a classic resistance strategy. It simply opposes climate change. The day is hot, we have a heat wave, we have an emergency, we turn up the air conditioning. It's relatively limited, right? There's, you can only turn up the air conditioner so much and if too many people turn them up, you can overload the system. In particular, it has the particularly nasty effect of increasing carbon emissions, which increases climate change. So it in, in general, I would say that most resistance strategies tend to be short-term, they're limited, and they're not very adaptable over time. In contrast, I'd argue that urban green roofs are a resilient strategy. They, if when during a heat wave, they help dissipate heat, they will buffer people from it in one of those green roofs, for instance, in the upper left, if you have a good insulative capacity like that, you may have reduced cooling and, cooling and heating needs by 30%, keeping the temperatures cooler in there. And in addition, if it's in a wet summer climate, the evaporation from plants as they transpire can add, turn this into a natural air condition in dealing with cooling it. So buffering and dissipating, not contributing to climate change and tremendous capacities for how one might design those situations, not just to reduce climate impacts, but also for other goods and services. We can think about green walls like these by Patrick LeBlanc. But when you apply the model, then it's okay, there's resilience if this reduces your heating and cooling bills. But is it resistant? Well, it might be that too. And it depends on what's going on under the hood here. So for instance, if you're using watering these, if you have to use pesticides and fertilizers, you could be doing other harm that makes these less adaptable over time and what I might say are really partially resistant. On the other hand, if there are ways that that green wall, which I don't think it can, could actually evolve over time, maybe it will self-organize to become more facilitative over time. Um, there's a lot of work obviously with green roofs in many places to do other benef co-benefits such as habitat roofs like this at the San Francisco Transbay Terminal. It's at very least certainly resilient in terms of buffering uh, those buildings from climate change and managing stormwater, but depending on the fragility of that system, how much you're trying to hold it in place or how much it might evolve over time, I would argue that it could also have qualities that are either resistant or facilitative. Thinking up in scale then to a restoration of large urban forests, such as the Amsterdam forest, it provides a refuge from the heat for people. It may even reduce an urban heat island effect over a larger urban area, so it's definitely resilient. It could be facilitative. Imagine if it uses drought or heat resilient trees that are suited to better suited to future climate, and especially if it includes enough species diversity to guard against the uncertainty of what the extent of future climate will be, and for the forest to actually evolve on its own over time. We're moving toward a more facilitative strategy. Hopefully this is making sense. So heat waves, examples of resistance, resilience, and facilitation. Let's switch to larger storms and flood. Here's a visualization of Manhattan undergoing a flood that not too recently would have been expected every 100 years, but could in fact become as frequent as every 10 years into the near future. So similar to the last, I wanna show you a quick slides talking about resilient strategies such as bigger stormwater pipes, resilience such as green stormwater infrastructure, and strategies that are resilient and potentially facilitative such as flood, floodplain restoration. So resistant resilient solutions often have rigid capacities. This is a system in Beijing where clearly you have a lot of capacity in there when flooding occurs for it to capture runoff and to move it quickly out of the city to prevent flooding. But it has a level to that, which could be easily exceeded. And it's not very easily updated for larger storms or floods that might exceed that capacity. In addition, Single focused resistance strategies like that can have undesirable side effects, such as these photos of some of the more stagnant concrete channels in Beijing that have biology in them, but it's not a healthy ecology. 
Stormwater facilities can mitigate runoff from large storms by harnessing ecological processes, particularly the microbes in soils to break down pollutants, to help store water in the soil and slow its release from urban stormwater runoff. They can also, as these ones attempt to do here in Portland, Oregon, create habitat and create interest in beauty. For instance, as the water level rises up and down over that stone wall, it reveals and hides the quality of it. This is an example from Sea Streets in Seattle. It was one of the very early stormwater uh, facilities that was built there. And in this case, I'd argue that it has a good chance of being an enduring solution because it solves more than one problem at a time. In the slide on the left before, that's a very steep slope that's hard to see going from the top to the bottom there. But you had tremendous runoff that I'll show in just a minute. But it also wasn't safe for kids and people to walk up and down those streets. There's no sidewalk. You had to walk along the street. And the solution on the right then has a combination of stormwater detention and cleansing facilities. It has a traffic calming effect by having that curve in the street to slow people down. And it separates pedestrians from the street so that they're on, they've got the stormwater facilities between them and the traffic on the road. And you see slides here of what the situation was like before and what it was like after. It has the benefits not only of flood mitigation, but of downstream salmon habitat protection, pedestrian safety, and beauty. A lot of solutions that are resilient also tend to integrate ecology te with technology. So that system in um, sea streets, as well as, as well as many stormwater facilities, are very highly technical systems with the soil media and the ways they process and cleanse the system over time, but that blend biological and technological components. You can use the framework to critique and ask questions about design. I'm a great admirer of the work of Beijing Olympic Forest Park in many ways for what is created as an amenity for the people of Beijing there. It certainly, its stormwater facilities confer resilience by absorbing and capturing stormwater and helping to cleanse it. But unless you look deeper into that, there may also be resistant facilities in there in terms of energy use or its limited capacity, or it could in fact be facilitative depending on the system's ability to itself reorganize over time in response to climate change. Certainly it has been designed with the idea of creating beauty, creating ecology for the, and sustenance for the human spirit. Yes, to my mind, that's a key landmark of what makes a design like this potentially enduring. You can move up to landscape solutions thinking about how one integrates stormwater and natural drainage systems in this design of the former Stapleton Airport by Wenken Associates in Denver, Colorado. And other work that Wenken Associates have done, for instance, this stormwater facility along a renovated parkway in Minneapolis that helps connect neighborhoods with a bike path. And when you look at that system, clearly there's a tremendous adaptability within that system to work well, whether you get a lot more rain or whether you don't because when there's no water in it, it's still this beautiful habitat with wildflowers in it. And as the water rises up, it fills it up and uses that capacity. Now, whether it's facilitative or not would depend a lot on whether the species diversity in there and its genetic diversity of the plants that are used allow it to adapt over time under different climate conditions. Because most horticultural plants are genetic clones of other plants, most horticultural practices would not support in that situation what I would call a facilitative design. Finally, you can look up to restoring entire floodplain ecosystems. Here in Eugene, Oregon, north of our city, we have an area shown in the slide above where you see agriculture along the banks of the Willamette River. And I've noted in red there, areas where riprap stones are lining the river to hold it in place so it doesn't flood people's homes and erode agricultural landscapes. But if we look back just 150 years ago, that was a wide braiding system where the river moved back and forth across the landscape, absorbing floodwaters and slowing down their force. And so we can't recover that now. We have too many people and homes and farms in the way, but we can in certain areas expand the floodplain, move the riprap back to actually create an area where the river can begin to meander both for floodplain protection for people downstream, as well as to create habitat upstream. So that's a set of thinking about resistance, resilience, and facilitation for large storms and floods. By now, hopefully this is being familiar to you. I want to switch over then to thinking about sea level rise. Can we apply the model in that way? 
Certainly there are many areas around the world and many areas around the Pacific Rim that are highly vulnerable to sea level rise, coast, low coastal zones, such as the slide shown on the left there. Um, this is a example of some of the countries with the highest urban populations living in low elevation coastal zones, China, in terms of the number of people there, and then places like Vietnam and Thailand in terms of the percentage of the country's population who are living in these very vulnerable coastal zones. Along the east coast of the US, if we do a quick simple bathtub model of what happens when you add a meter of water of sea level rise, which at one point was considered an extremely high level and is now considered a middle of the road estimate, um, you can see an area that probably has about 20 million people living in it. So pretty severe consequences that we have to deal with, that we're almost certain we have to deal with at some level. And we've seen enough sea level rise to know that it's happening already. So for sea level rise, again, for new settlements, some of the ability, the capacity to do resilient solutions is greater. We can avoid new urbanization in vulnerable areas. Just don't put people where the problems are gonna be. But what do we do in their existing settlements? Well, we can think about protective seed walls. We can resist climate change. We can think about policies and emergency infrastructure that limit the impacts and provide recovery systems. So notice that now, not just talking about spatial design for resilience, but recovery in institutions. At a more extreme end for facilitative solutions, we might actually consider those very difficult choices of relocating people from vulnerable areas, removing hardened edges and restoring coastal ecosystems. So. The Netherlands has been very successful for 100 years at being resistant, and they have continued to manufacture higher technology systems that are very sophisticated, that will probably continue to work well for them, but they are fairly fragile, potentially fragile produced technological systems. We think about in the US examples we've had of uh, storm surges that are what we're going to see increases of, of under climate change, and we haven't done very well in, for instance, in Hurricane Katrina or the flooding from Tropical Sandy. We have solutions were broke down. They were not resistant. They were not resilient. They were not facilitative. And particularly, we did a very poor job of having emergency systems in preparation that could respond quickly to dissipate the effects and help people recover from them. Mangrove restoration, though, is one of those strategies that can be very facilitative. For those of you who know them, they are, as you see the knees there, they're these sort of randomly spaced knees that come up, but they're actually highly sophisticated fractal dissipative energy structures that take the wave, the, cert, the energy of waves hitting them and they dissipate it incredibly efficiently. So if we think about the mangrove loss that is going on in many coastal areas due to development, that's not even a resistance strategy, it's just a bad one. We can think about conserving mangoes as a resilient strategy, and if we can actually expand them and begin to put mangroves into areas that may be inundated as sea levels rise and get ahead of that, I would argue that would be a facilitative solution to adaptation. So that's an, again, an example for sea level rise of different types of strategies. The last example I want to give you is thinking about wildfire. It's something that occupies a lot of us in the US West and is one of the core areas of my research that may not be as sort of immediately present for many of you across the Pacific Rim. I started giving presentations on this back in the early 2000s when what we thought were extreme wildfires back then, 3,200, 325 hectares, 22 people dead, 3,500 homes destroyed, seemed to be extreme. We began to see those events manifesting in Europe, Mediterranean climates, in Australia, and I haven't even updated to the real tragedies that happened in the US West in the last two years where just unprecedented numbers of homes were burned. Fortunately, few people died, but we're anticipating to see those increasing rapidly. So with climate change, a resistance strategy to suppress fire. We've tried it for the last 150 years. It's still a critically important, immediate, what do we do when there's a wildfire burning toward the city? But it has its limits to it. We can think about resilient strategies such as building defensible space around homes and fireproofing structures. We can reduce sprawl in hazardous areas. For facilitative strategies though, we really need to think about the landscape scale restoration of historically fire adapted ecosystems, which have the capacity to absorb fire, to reduce the fuel loads around so that future fires won't burn so hot. At the same time, burn through with low intensities. They don't threaten people or structures or habitats for these ecosystems. In my work then, 
once we thought of these strategies, it comes down to questions like, so which strategy is actually most effective? How do we apply them in different combinations in different places? What ones are landowners going to adapt? How do we create policies that might lead toward the kinds of solutions we see want to see on the ground? And will people's behavior after they respond to more wildfires? One of the hardest things we face is that reintroducing fire is critical. The very thing we've been fighting needs to be reincorporated and or mimicked in a variety of restoration contexts. So resistance has not worked. We have to learn how to bring fire back into our ecosystems. There are issues of smoke from prescribed fires. There's issues of danger, but there are ones we have to face under what we're seeing with the increased capacity for fire under climate change. Professor Johnson, I'm sorry I've been asked to give you a reminder. You have uh, quickly run out of yes, time. So I'll wrap up here. Wrap up your I've got it right there. So concluding thoughts, where does this leave us as we seek to craft robust solutions to an uncertain future? I'd argue that rapid change creates dangers and opportunities. As a young man, I worked in Beijing in the 1980s and was stuck in bicycle traffic jams, which have turned into traffic jams in the future. We can and will make solutions and changes rapidly. We have to make different kinds of choices now. I would argue we need some form of an adaptation toolbox that combines ideas like resistance and resilience and facilitation with others to guide design and planning for climate unlike anything we've experienced before. There's a lot of, for me, there's a lot of food for thought in thinking about the ways that these strategies that work, the ways they don't work. We'll just leave that there. And finally, we really need to think about enduring solutions that address the climate change crisis and satisfy the human spirit crafted across entire landscapes. We need new technological and ecological combinations of solutions in new urban forms and functions. And I hope that the idea of using this framework of resistance, resilience, and facilitation can help us imagine and critique solutions. Thank you, and my apologies for running over. It's a delight to be here today. Thank you very much, Professor Johnson. And uh, thank you for your uh, passionate as well as meticulous talk. I think your message is loud and clear. The tipping point is now. Is now. There is no time to waste. And uh, I think you also showed some uh, very detailed uh, strategies of uh, mitigation approaches and the failures and success of them. And uh, I'm sure uh, there are questions for you, um, but uh, we will collect them. And after we have had all three presentations, and then we will have some discussions there. Okay, thank you again, Professor Johnson. Thank you. Now, uh, next, Professor James Hayter will bring his thinkings about resilient urban landscape. And uh, James is the founding director of Oxygen and a landscape architecture and urban design practice based in Adelaide, Australia. Uh, he also served as uh, president of the International Federation of Landscape Architects, IFLA, since uh, 2018. So James, over to you. Thank you, Professor. That's reading all right? Yes. Yes, Very thank good. you. Well, friends, friends and colleagues, I'm honoured to join you in this webinar. Thank you very much for inviting me. What I'd like to talk about is really the landscape architecture profession. And I've entitled my little talk on 17 ways landscape architects are contributing towards landscape resilience. So what are the common values in the projects that define us as a landscape architecture profession? So COVID and climate change are the two compelling narratives that we all deal with today. So this is understand, understood by populations globally and politicians are now responding. Simply said, landscape architects are concerned with the health of global communities and they have the skills to be the most effective partner and leader in addressing these two major problems. So clean drinking water and food production are clearly important, but not every place in the world has these. In our cities globally, COVID has made us rethink how we order and use our public spaces. 
comfortable outdoor space is valued as a safe place for socialising. City parks and national parks are highly valued as a means to balance our global, regional, national and local ecosystems. They are all seen as being connected. Infrastructure corridors are realising large tracts of land that can be contribute towards increased tree canopy cover and balanced increased temperatures. Utilising these corridors is seen as a necessity, not a recreational or an aesthetic luxury. Designing and managing sustainable landscapes that counter climate change is first and foremost in everything we do as landscape architects and is our most compelling call to action as a profession. Landscape architecture is a profession for a new generation that wants climate action. It wants the reintroduction of nature into cities and it wants a more ethical society. I see landscape architecture today as the most relevant of all of the design professions. The sustainable development goals are a collection of 17 interlinked global goals designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. These were developed and promoted initially in 2015. What I want to do in this talk is to illustrate the work that landscape architects are having in meeting these goals. Resilience is not achieved by solving a single problem. Resilient landscapes are ones that are multi-layered and they're interlinked. So most often they work with existing physical, environmental conditions and communities. They incorporate a deep understanding of partnership, economics and culture. Like all resilient ecosystems, they take time to develop and to achieve balance. And these two quotes from uh, the World Bank show this point that these ecosystems need to be balanced, they take their time, and very much so they're, um, they're tied with, um, with economics. So what I'd like to do now is just to go through and show you examples of each of the ways in which landscape architects are addressing each of these sustainable development goals. Sustainable development goal one calls for no poverty and landscape architects are working to create and maintain the urban forest improve air quality, integrate low cost urban food production and produce low cost materials for construction. So apart from a minimal monetary amount of what it takes to live for a day, the United Nations indicates that poverty is also a lack of opportunity and access to education, adequate nutrition, civic participation and decent employment. Poverty brings with it slum living or homelessness, sexual and economic exploitation, limited or no health services, inadequate or non-existent training opportunities and inequalities. Landscape architects are part of this task to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. More than 700 million people or 10% of the world population still live in extreme poverty and is struggling to fulfill the most basic needs like health education and access to waste and sanitation. The majority of people living on less than $1.90 a day live in sub-Sahara Africa. Worldwide, the poverty rate in rural areas is 17.2%, more than three times what it is in urban areas. This project in Mexico City seeks to transform one of the city's poorest districts by building a park within the corridor of a major and now disused railway line linking Mexico City to Acapulco. The project contributes towards a social and physical transformation. It achieves a balance between economic and social development and between the preservation of heritage and transformation. STT2 calls for zero hunger. And landscape architects are promoting action based on transformation, innovation and resilience regarding food security and food sovereignty. So the Belvedere Park in Cologne, Cologne exemplifies the new typology of urban park, which has as its core food production, substituting amenity planting with fruit and vegetables. Farmers were involved in the layout and species selection. Wider paths for agricultural venues were included. 
a program of plant breeding was housed in a service barn. It was not intended to substitute agriculture to make the park, but to use it to create a new farm and a park at the same time. This project is very much about education and technique. SDHE3 looks at good health and well-being, and landscape architects are primarily concerned with ecological health. So ensuring healthy users and protecting the well-being at all ages is part of a resilient urban landscape. This Tel Aviv project represents a radical change. It connects the city's built fabric with its main natural resource, which is the sea. The proposal is about pedestrian connection. It breaches the existing barrier created by a highway and achieves access to the beach and its recreational opportunities there. SDD4 looks at quality education and landscape architects are adjusting education in, in, to meet critical challenges facing the natural environment and communities locally. Quality education is a foundation for resilient landscapes. We have seen its benefits in the early example of Belvedere Park with the technique, research and development of urban food production has resulted in a new park typology. This park is located in the heart of Manitoba in Canada, one of the city's most needy neighbourhoods. The park is nothing more than a bitumen car park that becomes a dance floor that is planted with 100 new trees. Not all projects we do as landscape architects need to cost a million dollars to demonstrate a transformation from an urban hotspot to a new place that is used by its local communities. SCD5, gender equality, and landscape architects are ensuring sustainable design that is appropriate to place is inclusive. Gender equality is empowering and achieving resilient landscapes. And it's almost an obligation that we design our landscapes that are safe and comfortable to be in. Sustainable space is only successful where it protects from the elements. Heat and rain is protected from pollution and it is safe and comfortable for all people to use. SDG 6 calls for clean water and sanitation and landscape architects are considering water management in urban areas through new approaches that integrate knowledge about territorial patterns and processes into development of management practices. So access to clean water plays a vital role in all aspects of social, economic and environmental development. Ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation is a basic task of landscape architects achieving resilient landscapes. The River Forest Island Park illustrates how seasonal flooding becomes a positive form maker for a new park. This park was completed in 2014 and it takes a different direction by honouring the native river hydrology and blending natural systems, local culture and a sand bar into a successful park. So instead of trying to control nature, with concrete walls, the design utilises nat natural wetland terraces on its edges. The dynamic variability and landscape of the wetland, riparian lowland and highland increase the, the resilience of this ecosystem. SCG 7 looks at affordable and clean energy. And landscape architects are advocating that good design reduces the need for heating and cooling. So energy is central to nearly every major challenge and opportunity the world faces today. So be it for jobs, security, climate change, food production, the available ability of cheap energy is an increasing factor in global economics. Working towards this goal is especially important and it interlinks with other sustainable development goals. Focusing on universal access to energy, increased energy efficiency and the increased use of renewable energy through new economic and job opportunities is crucial in creating more sustainable and inclusive communities and resilience to environmental issues like climate change. 
So few transformations will have such a profound impact on the appearance and functionality of our future landscapes as the coming energy transition. The world is gradually transforming from a fossil-based society towards renewable energy sources. This brilliant little project by H and N and S Landscape Architects gives an overview of the manner in which energy can be incorporated in spatial design and actually add to the quality of our everyday environments. Through projects in the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany, the landscape architects describe the effects of expansion of the energy network and illustrate the perspective of the future sustainable energy household. This is a brilliant proposition. SDG 9 looks at decent work and economic growth. In there, landscape architects are creating comfortable and safe workplaces that aid productivity. Sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all is key to resilient urban environments. By leading and coordinating other disciplines, landscape architects deal with interactions between natural and cultural ecosystems, such as adaptation and mitigation related to climate change and the stability of ecosystems, eco-economic improvements and community health and welfare to create places that anticipate social and economic well-being. Roughly half of the world's population still lives with the equivalent of $2 a day, with a global unemployment rate of 5.7%. Having a job doesn't guarantee the ability to escape from poverty in many places. The Lewa Wildlife Conservancy in Kenya works as a model and a catalyst for the conservation of wildlife and its habitat. The core intention is to educate about the ecosystem. Interventions are sensitive to the wider landscape and ecosystem. The educational value of the project is immersed in the involvement of local communities is a key benefit that ensures the ongoing improvement through management of the landscape. A grassland revegetation program is the place to enrich the native grassland, which has been reduced in biodiversity through grazing, non-burning and infestation by exotic penicetum and hibiscus flavifolius. Only local stone is used, no concrete. Topsoil collected from the surface runoff from roads is reused to establish new microhabitats. All materials, construction materials and labour are local. STG 9 looks at industry, innovation and infrastructure. And landscape architects are working on major infrastructure projects such as rail and road corridors, waterways and flood control that can have a positive effect in connecting communities and natural ecosystems. Increased demands for services which landscape architects provide show that new approaches influence opportunities for employment through investment in new sustainable solutions, green technologies and materials. As a profession, our aim is to build resilient infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. Investment in infrastructure, transport, migration, energy and information and communication technology are crucial in achieving resilient and empowering communities. It has long been recognised that growth in productivity and incomes and improvement in health and education outcomes requires investment in infrastructure. Working waterfronts are constantly in flux. They're utilitarian, usable and dissolving with temporal qualities that engage all of our, our uh, senses. Contemporary waterfront developments are often characterised by removal of these qualities that attract us in the first place. This project in New Zealand challenges these connections in a development that transforms an abandoned and sad industrial and maritime precinct into a layered mixed use precinct. The design of spaces provides an alternate approach to the typical erasure of memory. Friction is encouraged, smelly fish are an attraction Rust, grit and patina are embraced and derelict artefacts reprogrammed. The design weaves public realm experiences around found conditions. The park becomes a place of investigation. 
embracing and interpreting a narrative of place in the creation of a contemporary and authentic public realm experience. SCG 10 looks at reduced inequalities. So landscape architects are promoting good design as a catalyst for managing migration and promoting a common ground. To reduce inequalities, landscape must be accessible and available to everyone. Landscape services used to be equally distributed and affordable to the most deprived members of our communities. As landscape architects, we task ourselves with safeguarding the viability of the natural environment and work towards developing and maintaining a humane environment. Our objective is to continue towards reducing inequality. The international community has made significant gains towards lifting people out of poverty. The most vulnerable nations, the least developed countries and the small island developing states continue to make inroads into poverty reduction. However, inequality persists and large disparities remain regarding access in particular to health and education. Superkilan is a project that you'll know well. It's located in a culturally diverse quarter of Copenhagen. The ambition is a global universal garden that relates to the community in which it serves. Significant elements from other places and cultures are transferred and reflected in the multi-ethnic structure of the neighborhood. The design was determined after months of workshops and community participation. Cultural objects become ambassadors of a global urban culture where global information and communication are the norm. SCG 11 looks at sustainable cities and communities and landscape architects are applying nature-based solutions to sustainably protect, manage and regenerate natural and modified ecosystems, addressing social challenges effectively and adaptively while providing benefits for biodiversity and human well-being. The media are constantly reminding us that our cities are mostly unprepared for extreme weather phenomena. Absorption of excess stormwater clashes with the presence of impervious surfaces that prevent stormwater entering the ground. At the same time, a low percentage of green areas translates into a failure to absorb excess runoff. Our task as landscape architects is to make cities inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Cities are hubs for ideas, commerce, culture, science, productivity, social development, and much more. At their best, cities enable people to advance socially and economically. With the number of people living in cities projected to be 5 billion people in 2030, it is important that efficient urban planning and management practices are in place to deal with the challenges brought by urbanisation. Again, you'll know this project by James Cornerwell. And the High Line is a precedent uh, uh, park. Sorry, a gentle reminder, you, you have one minute to elements. So you can kind of like the presentation. That, yeah, that transforms 30 kilometres of infrastructure into parkland as a new model for greening other cities. It is an urban reclamation project that preserves and recycles Number 12 is about responsible consumption and production. And landscape architects are developing and implementing strategies to reduce food waste, responsibly manage chemicals and waste, and remediate contaminated and post-industrial site. So our role as landscape architects is to contribute towards sustainable consumption and production patterns. Sustainable consumption and production is about promoting resource and energy efficiency. This project in China is well known to you. Like other contemporary projects located on rivers subject to flooding, the park is designed to establish a balanced eco uh, ecosystem that accepts flooding, has, has multiple layers built within it. 13 on climate action. And Let's go back to committed to implementing a declaration of climate and biodiversity emergency and to the principles embedded in SGD 13. So climate change affects every country and every continent, it disrupts natural economies and affects lives, costing people, communities and countries today and into the future. 
In Bangkok, this project is called the Metro Forest and it demonstrates that reforestation is possible in a mega city that is suffering the effects of dense urbanization and increased urban temperatures. Life below the water. <clears throat> so landscape architects are making a positive contribution towards an integrated and strategic approach to the management of blue green infrastructure, including the reduction in discharge of nutrients, pollutants, sediments, and debris from the land into waterways and the sea, and the management and attenuation of flooding. This is a theoretical project from the United States that reuses material dredged from Galveston Harbour for shipping lanes to be placed within durable grid-like structures. This artificial archipelago provides defence against storm surges before waves reach the shore, whilst also contributing to ecological habitat growth and also people's recreational use. Landscape architects are working to integrate urban ecosystem corridors and nodes with similar systems in peri-urban, rural and regional areas. This is a simple but brilliant project in the west of Iceland that reverses the damage caused by tourists visiting the summit of Saxol, a 45 metre high volcanic oval shaped crater. The 1.5 metre wide new pathway of expanded Cortez steel steps goes up the crater on a well-worn alignment of many years of foot traffic. The result is that every visitor now stays on the track. Social media, the project is known as the stairway to heaven. Landscape architects are designing safe places that are active and where people are comfortable to be in. Safe places are inclusive and can reduce violence. Every day across the world, communities are experiencing benefits, but also feeling the effects of industrialization, urbanization, and the search for energy. George Hargrave's design for Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park provides the centerpiece for the Olympic Games in London and the precedent for subsequent events we seek to demonstrate their green credentials. And finally, partnership for the goals. And landscape architects are strengthening partnerships with other likewise advocates for resilience, working together to find the best ways to enhance the sustainable future. The International Federation of Landscape Architects has realised that it can be most effective in advocating for resilience by working in partnership. It is our task to help revitalise the global partnership for sustainable development. A successful sustainable development agenda requires partnerships between governments, private sector and civil society. These inclusive partnerships build upon principles and values, a shared vision and shared goals that have placed people and the planet at the centre. And these are needed at a global, regional, national and local level. Finally, I'd just like to congratulate SJ to you on their establishment anniversary. And I'd like to thank both SJ to you and APU for holding this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Thank you for your patent book of 17 solutions. And uh, I hope they will be used, put into practice. Um, I particularly like the way that you have uh, yes, given sir. the profession of landscape arch architecture a noble, a noble uh, goal. That is, uh, that is social engineering, and um, uh, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. Uh, this century is a time of landscape architects, and the mm. time. Uh, being an architect myself, I have to admit um, the time for the architects have gone past. So, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, again, we will collect the questions and then we will have the Q and A um, at the end uh, oh. with the three speakers. Now, let me welcome Professor Che Sen Chen, my colleague, Shanghai Jiao Tong School of Design. Professor Che's research focuses on urban ecosystem services and the ecological planning, smart city and climate adaptive city, ecological 
uh, restoration <coughs> design and the carbon neutral design. So he will speak on design theory and case study of resilient landscape in Spanish city. All right, please take the floor, Professor Chu. Okay, thank you, Professor Ryan. So can you see my sharing screen? Yes. Okay, okay. Okay, hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about design theory and the key study of resilient landscape in Spanish city of China. Uh, this talk will be mainly divided into three parts. The first one is the overview of Spanish city uh, in China. Then I will introduce some uh, relevant research and the project in School of Design. At last, uh, I will share you a rural wetland planning project as an example. So, okay. Uh, so, Spanish city has experienced significant development in China for decades. Many relevant policies were put forward from the national government. Actually, Eco Ecological City was proposed in 2003, and Spanish City was put forward since uh, 2014. Uh, it mainly includes three aspects uh, for Spanish City uh, protect the urban uh, ecological system, uh, ecosystem restoration, and low impact development. Uh, Spanish City uh, referred to comprehensive applications of six uh, stormwater management strategies. They are infiltration, retention, accumulation, uh, purification, reuse, uh, drainage. In the past, a quick drainage pattern has more than 80% of drainage, but it could reach to less than 40% for Spanish City. According to a, tech, a technical guideline for Spanish City construction, the total run of control reach should be between 88% uh, and 85%. Run of peak should be e e effectively reduced or delayed. Uh, pollutant include SS, COD, TN, and TP should be controlled. By uh, 2030, uh, more than 80% of the urban built-up area in China is asked to meet requirements of a spawned city. Uh, the right finger shows the distribution of annual total runoff control reach in mainly, uh, mainland of China. It was divided into five parts, and uh, Shanghai has, uh, has 75 to 85% belong to the uh, purple. In China, 16 and 14 city, cities was listed as small city palace in uh, 2015 and 2016, respectively. Uh, for this part, I will introduce some researches on small city in our school. Uh, six projects relevant to small city has been finished in the past. Uh, most of them are supported by the national uh, or local government. We have published one book called Research and Practice uh, for Spanish City. Uh, we also have uh, eight national invitation patents and 10 papers published. You know, major Spanish City technology include rain garden, uh, bioswale, uh, permeable pavement, and the plant community with higher canopy inter interception, as well as artificial white land, green roof, and the wet pond. We did some research works in terms of rainfall, soil, water, and vegetation of, of Shanghai. First, we analyzed the, the rainfall and its in intensity in Shanghai. The finger on the left is a distribution map of annual rainfall and the right one is for the flooding uh, period. Second, second one is the soil uh, porosity and its restoration uh, capacity analysis. We found our skirt has higher soil porosity than city center and suburbs. Residential and commercial areas have low soil porosity than other types. Third, the, polluted, uh, the pollutant removal analysis 
uh, showed that the green space with transforming uh, structure help to reduce the pollutant uh, significantly. Through rainfall simulation experiment, we put forward the most effective pattern regarding removal of different uh, pollutants. Furthermore, uh, plant canop uh, canopy interception evaluation were conducted finger on the uh, upright showed three facilities we used. It is found related to the leaf area index, canopy rainfall interception capacity of conifer is high, but the law for broad leaved trees. We also estimated canopy for rainfall regulation by different trees, giraffes area and types, and soil or types. Through designing special experimental equipment, our team developed, uh, developed the rain garden uh, suitable in Shanghai regarding its structure and uh, configuration. Three rain garden structure uh, suitable in Shanghai, uh, it was a uh, round of uh, re regulation type, storm water uh, purification type, and comprehensive type. For each type, we proposed uh, unique uh, structural uh, parameters. Apart from green garden, bioswell in Shanghai was also developed. We designed the special e experimental equipment. These are structural bioswell with best uh, performance in storm water re regulation and uh, pollutant removal respectively. Plant species uh, suited for Shanghai were selected regarding uh, their uh, capacity of drought resistant, uh, flood tolerant, and uh, pollution uh, removal. We choose uh, 25 species common in Shanghai and uh, sequence them in their capacities according to the cluster analysis. Uh, several species were recommended. After plant species screening, we put forward several configuration patterns of a rain garden. Fingers on the right shows the rain garden in the park and the square. There are planting patterns of a roadside and the riverside in the up fingers. The finger on the below right shows a, a vertical view of the structural pattern. In the past, our team has taken uh, six practice projects regarding the bond city in different parts of China. So this part, uh, I will share uh, one of the example uh, of the, uh, share one share one of them as an example. It's about the rural wetland planning in Changshu, uh, Jiangsu province. Uh, first, we all know rural wetland has uh, multi functions like uh, protecting water resources, conserving farming culture, uh, creating an integrated space for rural life, agriculture production, uh, providing layer and uh, recreation space. So rural wetland actually include living space, agriculture production space, and ecological space. The village is located in the Changshu, Jiangsu province. It, it is within one hour traffic circle to Shanghai. The site is totally 122 uh, hectares. It may landscape, uh, land use is residential land, agriculture land, fish pond, and water system. First, we made several uh, investigation and uh, uh, analysis on its water, soil, and biological resources. Regarding the water quality, we took 24 uh, samplings, and most of them were found to be belong to the uh, fifth category. Uh, major polluted is TN and TP. For vegetation, uh, 17 types of plant community were investigated and classified into five major types. We also investigated the animal resources, mainly are birds and fish. They have several species that were listed as a, the state protective. Besides, uh, its ecological sensitivities were uh, elevated, uh, evaluated, we classified them into four levels. They are extremely uh, sensitive. 
highly sensitive, sensitive and less sensitive. Based on the investigation and analysis, we propose five major planning strategies. They are improving water resources, uh, optimizing re uh, residential environment, uh, protecting and restoring uh, rural wetland ecosystem, uh, developing green, uh, green agriculture, uh, promoting later tourism. Uh, this is the master planning, and uh, this is the uh, birth view. Uh, we divided into uh, several function zones, mainly include village, wetland, and paddy uh, field. Uh, based on the Spanish city theory, the rural wetland system was constructed from the uh, perspective of wet water resource, landscape, environment, uh, cultural value, and uh, leisure activities. We proposed through Spanish city technology, a uh, technical application, uh, ecosystem protection, ecological restoration, and law impact development. We uh, analyzed and compare, compared rainwater runoff of the site before and after the planning. It is shown that rainwater runoff was significantly uh, decreased through, through our planning and the green uh, infrastructure. Uh, this is a calculation of the runoff pollution loss of the site. Through our planning, the runoff uh, pollution like TNTPCOD was uh, significantly uh, decreased. We expected to increase the total runoff control rate from 15% uh, uh, to 85% and improve the polluted removal rate till 70% for the village. The special layout of Spawn City technology is so clear. Uh, different Spawn City facilities targeted for different land were developed for its water network. Uh, based on its existing problem, we changed the channel, uh, installed uh, pipes, pipes, pipes to treat polluted water. We also did hydraulic uh, planning for the agriculture land. Eco ditch, underground uh, pipes, and pump uh, were installed. Furthermore, a unique uh, four level paddy field wetland system was developed. It consists of the paddy field, bioswale, aquatic vegetation, and, uh, and the river. We divided the comprehensive utilization of rainfall rain water for the village. The left finger is its structural pattern and the right one is its spatial distribution. A picture show here are completed, completed rain garden and other facilities. We combine them with production function with vegetables, uh, fruit trees, and uh, ornamental uh, plants. Uh, this, uh, th uh, these are structural uh, patterns of rainwater cycle for paddy field and pond, a forest and, uh, and a road. Finally, I'd like to uh, show you some picture of the rural wetland after it uh, conducted. Okay, this is all about my talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Cher. And it's wonderful to see uh, a so-called uh, sponge city concept, uh, a porous landscape it has been well-researched, but better still put in practice. Um, this is a very promising project. Uh, now, uh, thank you all the three speakers for your wonderful presentations. And uh, I can see in the chat room, we have already received uh, many questions and uh, people have sent in uh, a lot of praises for the talks. Um, now, I do not think we will have enough time to go through all the questions today. We still have to manage time. And uh, I will attempt to summarize the questions for 
uh, each of you. And uh, because our listeners uh, do not have uh, the opportunity to turn on their microphone to ask questions directly, and understandably, we will have to manage uh, the chat room situation. And this is a, a intricate task, of course, when you have too many people online. So uh, I will try my best, but also I would like to encourage the speakers to ask questions to each other. All right, now uh, let me start with Professor Johnson and uh, Professor Johnson, you have received quite a few questions. And uh, uh, I think uh, as far as I can see, um, that there, there, are, there are three areas that people are particularly interested in and to see whether or not you can elaborate on further. The, the first one is a specific one. And uh, um, you mentioned that you lived in Beijing and uh, uh, there's a question from Shanghai. Uh, I think the question roughly is that uh, Shanghai, the current urban landscape is not terribly porous. And you promoted uh, uh, porous landscape, uh, sponge city, as Professor Cher has put it. So, uh, whether or not you have any particular ideas for the transformation of the urban landscape in Shanghai to make it more um, resilient, uh, that's question one. And question two, and uh, uh, one listener is particularly interested in your idea of uh, uh, marrying uh, the abilities or uh, the uh, approaches of landscape architects with that of the engineers, or whether or not they are doing two different jobs, and uh, how do you how do you enable them to collaborate? And uh, the third question is a very specific one. There's 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 a question concerning mangroves, and uh, let me read it out for you. Um, I'm afraid you've frozen on my screen and I can't hear you. Ah, um, ah there you go. I, okay. Yeah, here it is. Many argue that, many argue that mangroves are great, but they require a lot of time to get established. If there were cyclone, tsunami, mangroves wouldn't be established. And what are your thoughts on this challenge? All right, I, I think that's pretty much uh, for you. And th there are more. But uh, 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 I, sh I should let you start, and then we will we will organize questions for James well, and then Professor Chen. Okay, over to you. Well, thank you. I'll I'll try to answer. Remember them and try to answer fairly quickly on them. Uh, the first with the Shanghai. I mean, I think this is a challenge of so many cities where we are so they are so thoroughly paved. There is very little surface area to absorb. Right. This is just one of the consequences of our forms of urban design, and it's a huge challenge. I mean, certainly there are proposals in some places to depave. I honestly think that our ability to depave large cities, it's quite the challenge. They're occupied by things with economic value and social value. But I do think that there are then ways to think about stormwater, doing more engineering solutions. So the basic principles of the attempt to create sponge cities, which Professor Xinquanche talked so eloquently about, the measurements, the technical needs for that at their base are simple, right? The idea that we have turned landscapes into pipes that quickly transport water instead of slowly absorbing it and releasing it like a sponge. Um, there is so, certainly some capacity to do that with engineered systems that again, hold back the water and release it. There are other ways of cleansing water. So in some cases, you really have to use very large detention systems and tanks just to hold the water back so you can release it slowly. There may be ways, again, that are more expensive to uh, bring the water to the surface, to transport it or bring it into our parks where it can be um, treated. But I think you've posed a key question that once we create a city that has this weakness, this extreme pavement, it's very difficult to undo that. So it's a longer question that I don't think we have time for, but I really appreciate that the uh, author thinking about that. Shanghai is a, is a magnificent city. The second question you had, was about, um, can, I'm sorry, can you just repeat it again? I almost had it. 
Oh, the, the second one was about um, uh, the capacity of landscape architects uh, and uh, oh, that certainly. of the, the engineering. engineers. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, and I can, do I can answer. Things? I can answer no better than my really good colleague, Bill Wenk of Wenk Design in Colorado, who in a chapter in our book from 2002 on ecology and design, wrote a very compelling chapter about the need for landscape architects to engage with the engineers. And basically what he said was, if you want to bring ecology into urban areas, you need to learn how to talk to the engineers because the engineers know how to get things done. They tend to have relatively narrow viewpoints of what a good solution is, but he always said he found them extremely open. If you posed a problem and said, well, here's the problem and we're trying to work on and threw it at them, they would generate the kind of technical solutions that are needed. Remember I said a lot of bringing ecology back into the, into the city involves technological solutions to make them work in these very altered environments. So yes, I think we do need landscape architects to be communicating with the engineers respectfully, but also posing questions to them that push them out of their sometimes narrow boxes. And the third question is about mangroves. I'm not an expert on mangrove, but I th my sense of that question was a very thoughtful one, is that mangroves take a long time to establish and grow. So how do you quickly create solutions that might engage the biology of species and communities that simply don't you can't just put them out one year and, and five or 10 years from now, they're well established. That question becomes even more imperative when we think about the rates at which sea level rise may occur and whether in fact ecosystems can move and establish at those rates and under potentially those very dynamic, highly disturbed conditions where we're having more, not just higher water levels, but more extreme floods. These are problems. Again, we need to mitigate as much as we can to reduce the problem. But I think that this is the kind of creative problem that designers, that engineers and ecologists must come together on to be able to craft solutions. Landscape architects on their own are probably can't do it. Ecologists on their own probably can't do it. Engineers can't do it on their own. But the kind of creative solutions we come up with when we do that collaboration, as in some of the examples that James gave us, are frankly quite profound. So as much as the challenge is steep, I have a lot of faith in our ability to begin to craft these kinds of solutions. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Professor Johnson. Thank you, thank you. They're wonderful, they're wonderful responses. And it's interesting when you said that Shanghai is largely paved, but not long ago, before the Opium War, Shanghai was a water town. Shanghai was an intricate mm -hmm. network of, uh, of uh, canals. Uh, that was a, a idyllic kind of uh, ecosystem with mm. uh, uh, agriculture irrigation drinking water and wastewater discharge largely relying on the mighty tide from the Hong Kong river but when the europeans came they started filling up the canals and they built roads and uh, uh, the rest of the history the rest of that is history so when we yeah. say there are two major rivers in shanghai suzhou creek and the Huangpu river but in fact it was it was a very big village of water network. Mm. Whether or not we can turn the time back, turn the clock back, I think we can. That's restoration. Why not? Yeah. Uh, it depends on how, how much will we have. Okay. Now, uh, let me turn to James. Um, James, and uh, uh, I think there are uh, quite a few questions for you, but uh, let me summarize. Uh, the first one is an interesting one. Since you said you recently caught COVID and everybody in Australia has caught COVID, and the question is about what can landscape architects do in, on, under the uh, circumstance of the new normal? Uh, first question, you, you have a pattern book of uh, 17 you know, effective strategies. Uh, what about having one more against COVID? And the second one is about food security. And you, you, you did mention, you know, uh, urban uh, agriculture, but you said, no, it's not going to replace uh, food production. To what extent the landscape architects may contribute to that? I think these are the two major questions for you. Yeah. Sure, thank you for those questions. So just the first one, and 
if I can, I'll, I'll give almost like a, a global perspective of this, I think, and say that look, there are two factors which have really become populist in the last probably two or three years, and that's climate change, and it's, uh, the second is COVID. And I think both of those have made even more relevant the practice of landscape architecture because of uh, sort of the reasons I think we're all talking about in it. So COVID has meant we're really looking at outdoor spaces. And I think in many cities, we're valuing outdoor spaces. So um, you're right in Australia, there's been um, a lot of COVID, a lot of people are, are living with it now. We've opened up, we've stopped wearing masks. Um, you know, it, it's quite a different world. And now outdoor spaces are valued in a way that they weren't as valued before because people are saying that in an architectural office, do you want to sit in a row with computers sitting next to your colleague one metre away? Those, those office spaces have changed now. So there's been a complete design of work, redesign of workplace in it. And outdoor rooms, for example, we're designing a park at the moment, which has got a series of outdoor pods that uh, become meeting rooms. So, you know, we're looking at how outdoor space is designed in a different way. What's been really interesting to me is that politicians have been brought along, at least in our country, they've been dragged along. So it's a populist movement now. So it's, you know, it's young people, as everybody is talking about, what do we do about COVID? Yes, there's no debate that there's climate change. I mean, two years ago, yes, people were saying, mm, we have septics, it might not happen. But now everyone accepts that there's climate change and then, you know, we can get on and do something about it. And I think the professions are ideally placed to uh, do that. And it's something Bart said that is quite right. We we now live in a multidisciplinary um, world where we, we work as professionals in it. But I'd, I'd still advocate that landscape architects have the skills as leaders and, we need to really reverse our own thinking and say, yes, you know, we can become specialists and we can provide uh, solutions to individual problems, but somebody's got to take an overview. It's not city planners. Um, with a respect, it's not architects now. Uh, it's a different profession, landscape architecture, uh, than it was even two years ago because of COVID and um, and uh, climate action. The second one on food security, and again, if I could use a global perspective in, in that we, again, look at ourselves and the fantastic work that's happening in China um, and in other countries in addressing uh, food security. And in many ways, we're a lot better off than we were five years ago because we've got these techniques that people like Professor Shea uh, have been working on so well. But also we deal in uh, countries like Malawi and Kenya and some of the countries in Africa. And, and the question is still there, but we don't suffer from the extraordinary droughts that were there in Ethiopia 15 years ago and 20 years ago. And it's by positive action through research and different techniques, even the little experiments of the project I showed in Kenya there, that um, they are addressing questions like food security in countries where uh, you know, poverty is, is really reigning. Of the, um, the 28 uh, poorer countries in the world, which are recognised by the UN, 27 are in Africa. And it's our responsibility to not only to look after ourselves in our own countries, which are very privileged, but it's also to look at these other countries and to use some of the techniques that we've been talking about today to be able to um, influence uh, things like food security. I think the professions have made a huge difference uh, to it over the past five or 10 years. And I think that needs to continue on. All right, thanks, James. Uh, there are quite a few questions for Professor Cho, but uh, let me summarize. I, I think that there are two specifically for you concerning your topic of sponge city. And the first one is very similar to what has been asked to Professor Johnson. So Professor Cho, and in your uh, opinion, for cities which are well established and largely paved and not porous, how do you implement the concept of sponge city into the existing urban fabric? That's question one. And question two, and uh, uh, in China, and uh, the current push for uh, the uh, two low carbon targets, and uh, under this circumstance, 
And how is that related to your Sponge yeah. City idea and practice? All right. So two questions for you, Professor Cho. Okay. Okay. That's all good question. Uh, for first one, I think uh, the rebuilt uh, for the uh, for the old town or uh, already uh, community is necessary because according to the principle of the uh, Saban city, the human uh, construction or planning uh, has to uh, harmony uh, with the, the natural process. Uh, in another uh, words, is we need to respect uh, the natural process or reduce uh, the impact for the natural process. Uh, for the old town, it's uh, built for instance, maybe uh, 15 years or 100 years ago. So at that time, we, we, we have not paid uh, our, uh, you know, uh, haven't paid some uh, more pay, uh, attention for the natural process. Uh, but uh, it's not completely uh, rebuilt. Uh, I think we can, uh, to change the, the some, uh, uh, some green land uh, to the, uh, uh, to the habitat, uh, to the rain garden, or uh, bioswale, or we can uh, we should protect the small uh, small pond at the urban uh, wetland. Uh, so for second uh, question is uh, is much big question is uh, uh, the urban ecosystem protection or the ecological restoration uh, for spawn city and the carbon neutrality uh, are same. Uh, are, are consistent. A small city mainly thought on rainwater management and low impact development uh, for the uh, hydro, hydrology, uh, which is also a part of the low carbon and carbon neutral technology. But in addition to the ecosystem uh, protection and the low carbon, uh, low uh, development, low impact development, uh, there are also some specialized uh, technology for carbon neutrality. Uh, for instance, carbon uh, carbon garden, uh, urban wetland. Uh, you know, wetland, uh, which has higher carbon sink function uh, than uh, general, than commonly uh, uh, green land. Uh, sometimes it's four times, uh, four to six times. Uh, and the carbon sink green space, uh, a higher efficiency carbon uh, sequestration uh, plant community and some low carbon management uh, technology. So if low carbon goals are considered, Swan City design can, can take those technologies uh, in addition to the Swan City uh, rainfall, rainwater runoff control in uh, it can to increase a uh, carbon sink and uh, reduce uh, carbon emission uh, in, uh, in dictators. Okay, that's my <laughs> answer for the, that two question. All right, very plausible, thank you. And uh, uh, so speakers, I wonder if you have questions for each other uh, because you can all control your microphone. So if you wish to ask each other question and feel free, please. So it looks like you are all happy with each other and uh, all questions have been very well answered. All right, and uh, so in that case, there, there are a few more questions. So let me choose one or two. And uh, uh, there, there's one more for Professor Johnson when you're talking about your effective strategies and uh, one lesson that is particularly interested in the choices of plants. So do you have anything more to say about that? Yeah. Uh, you, you need to turn on your microphone, uh, Professor Johnson. You have been muted. How's that? Good. Yeah, I'd be glad to answer that. And I did type a little comment to that. I, I saw that. But I think that's a really important question. So I'm both a landscape architect and ecologist. So I pay a lot of attention to plant ranges and we've actually done a number of fairly large studies of the impacts of climate change on different plant species and ecosystems. And there are some cases when species that live in a particular area may no longer be able to persist there on their own. And certainly for many, some native species, we talk a lot about whether we need to have what's called assisted migration, where we help them move to new climate zones. Um, 
at the same time, in many cases, particularly in urban design, I think that people may have gotten too concerned about those immediate effects. We already in urban areas have done, if you look at the plants that are there, we've moved them from very different climate zones. We tend to nurture them and give them care and tending in urban zones. So I think in many cases, plants will persist. They persist there in part because they don't have competition like they do in natural ecosystems. Often they lose out native species, not because they can no longer persist in area climatically, but because they don't do quite as well and somebody else does better than them. So one of the things that to me is actually a pretty big issue is that I've seen people who think they're responding carefully to the climate emergency suddenly propose bringing in all kinds of species from around the world because they're panicking. And I've seen some very poor choices recommended when in fact, I think usually we can look for native species to local nearby ecoregions and selectively find plants that are probably going to do well and we may want to move in. But one of the problems of moving species from all around the globe that we've seen again and again is the number of horticultural species that become an invasive in an area. And by invasive, I don't just mean they do well. I mean, they tend to take over ecosystems, they dominate and they push out of the way many of the native species. They can cause extreme problems and landscape architects have not been as good as they need to be about being careful on that. So I'm personally quite cautious about the need to move plants around all over the place under climate change. I think we can be selective. I recommend people to talk to ecologists about that too. Thank you. All right, thank you. So when it comes to cross-cultural exchange, migration of ideas is good, but then when it comes to plant migration, we have to be very careful. <laughs> I think that's the message, a very important message. Uh, all right, um, like all good seminars, we quickly run out of time and uh, uh, all parties must end. And I hope this is only the beginning of uh, more and the future wonderful exchange of ideas by using the platform of APRU. Now, today's event is also named as the 14th session of the Landscape Architects Forum, which is a series of academic lectures jointly held by Shanghai Zhao Tong School of Design and the Shanghai Landscape Architecture Society. So this series of lectures is open to professional students and uh, the SLA members and the general public. As I said, we have uh, uh, the Chinese Billy Billy live broadcasting today, in addition to our Zoom. Uh, anyone who has an interest uh, can participate in this lecture series. And it aims to promote the exchange uh, of ideas. Now, uh, let us welcome uh, Professor Zhu Xiaoming, Chair of the Shanghai Landscape Architecture Society, to have uh, the final words, to offer some closing remarks. Uh, so, Professor Zhu will address the audience in Chinese, and uh, uh, our colleague Si Yi has very kindly agreed to offer uh, some translation. Uh, 尊敬的海特主席,尊敬的我们阮院长,尊敬的阮院太平洋大学联盟的官员以及我们今天在座的各位与会的嘉宾,各位老师,各位同学,大家好。Uh, dear distinguished guests, IFLA President, Professor Hater, the APRU members and all participating guests, professionals and students, thank you for joining today's session. 今天非常荣幸能够跟大家一起齐聚云端，共同探讨韧性城市以及环境建设的相关的议题。当前呢，中国和世界多个城市一样，都面临着如何应对今天讲座中各位教授提到的多种环境问题的挑战。
And it's such a great honor to get us online and to discuss the issue of resilient cities and their environment construction. Uh, I'm honored to say many cities in China and the rest of the world are facing grand challenge of dealing with various environmental problems mentioned by in today's webinar. 在这样的一个大的背景下，我们这次的研讨会，大家讨论了风景园林规划和设计如何应对我们现在的气候变化、城市的可持续发展以及生态设计等重要的议题。and under this context, today's session indeed provides inspiring ideas on how the planning and design of landscape architecture can deal with important issues such as climate change, sustainable development, and ecological design. Huyu 在城市可持续发展中扮演重要的角色, as well as to call on professionals to draw attention to urban environmental issues and actively engage in all walks of life. 我们需要通过更加紧密的国际合作跟交流来实现我们理论跟实践的结合,促进我们多元文化的碰撞以及思想的交融。探索更加科学、更富创意的解决方案. Uh, it is our goal to achieve the combination of theories and practice to close the international cooperations and exchanges in a multicultural way and to explore more scientific and creative solutions. 今天的活动我看到我们线上参会的人数很多,所以也是衷心感谢大家对这次研讨会的支持。Thank you all for the audience watching live with us today, and thank you for your huge support. Yeah,期待我们共同期待今后上海市风景园林学会能够继续和加强各个与各个高校的携手合作,共同推进我们学科的产学研的紧密结合,为大家提供更多的优质的专业资源。与大家共同探讨、探索如何把我们的城市、我们的共同家园建设得更加具有柔性、更富于魅力。We also sincerely hope that the Shanghai Landscape Architecture Society can continue to strengthen the cooperation with leading universities in the future and to jointly promote close integration of production, education, research, and the development of landscape architecture education. 谢谢大家,也谢谢小曾老师的翻译。Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhu, and uh, uh, thank you for your continuing uh, support to Shanghai Jiao Tong School of Design and the Landscape Profession. And uh, uh, Professor Zhu also very graciously thanked uh, um, our wonderful CE for her uh, interpretation. Uh, so, um, Dear audience, and it's been a wonderful afternoon in Shanghai. And uh, um, so on behalf of the school, and uh, let us uh, uh, again join our hands together to thank our four wonderful presenters today. And uh, I hope, um, you know, uh, the COVID lockdown will soon ease and the situation will become whatever the new normal is, but uh, we still would like to have the opportunity, not in the too distant future, welcoming all to Shanghai and to Shanghai Jiaotong School of Design. Uh, so thank you again and good afternoon and see you next time. Thank you so much, hope to see you soon. See you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Good day. 谢谢。